Hello, listeners. I am really excited to have Liza Rader on the podcast today. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you. Um, I took your amazing webinar. I think that was a few months ago, Understanding Exercise, Unlocking an Integral Part of Any Behavior or Wellness Plan. And then, and you were talking about your Toller um, Biscuit Mm -hmm. on the webinar a lot, which I'm sure you'll be talking about today as well. Um, And then we hopped on a call because I was exploring the idea of going through a breeder to get my next dog. And you successfully talked me out of Doug (laughs) Toller. (laughs) <laughs> I do that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it was funny. Like my, my good friend, Kayla Fratt, she was like, she's like, what about duck tolling retrievers? I'm like, yeah, I should hop on a call with Liza. And then it was like, I don't think so, but thank you. <laughs> I think it was the screaming that did it. <laughs> it, it was, it was the screaming. Um, so we're going to talk about your really cool exercise framework today on the podcast. But before we do that, I'd love you. Well, you share your life with Biscuit, as we just mentioned, but also you share your life with Percy. And I am curious what your favorite things are about them. So I'll start with Percy because he's older. My favorite thing about Percy is that he makes so many people so happy. He is like the little like light that walks into a room. Um, Like his, his groomers bought him a, a uh, little unicorn toy because he was stealing theirs and dancing around the room with it. Like he just makes people happy. It's so sweet. That's so sweet. He's very flashy. He loves the attention. Um, and then, I mean, I can't pick one thing with Biscuit. Biscuit's like a little hunk of my soul that broke off and started running around. Um, mm. And he's very closely related to all of the dogs that I've had, sort of, except for my herding dogs. And he's just, he's perfect in every way. Oh, that's so lovely. I love both of those things. I can imagine both of them, like Percy just saying hello, work in the room and Biscuit, just like this soulful powerhouse, like that. That's he's a like a little, you. yeah, he's like a little ball of kinetic energy. Oh my God. Yeah. I see it. <laughs> um, okay. So let's dive into your exercise framework. So I thought this was so smart in terms of how you presented it and and what a great way to talk about it to our clients. So can you talk about the framework? Yeah. So I, I, first of all, I have to give props to Sarah Strumming because this is sort of the thing that happened in my brain after listening to her talk about her frameworks, um, the four steps to behavioral wellness. And in my brain, <laughs> exercise and enrichment are kind of the same thing. Like they're two sides at the same time. It's stuff we're doing with the dog. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm thinking of exercise, not so much as fitness, but as getting out and moving their body in different ways. So I found that I needed to start breaking down those kind, the kinds of enrichment the dogs were getting and the kinds of exercise they were getting to just have more accurate language for myself. And then for later for talking to clients about like what works and what doesn't, what do we need more of? So I can't just say Mm -hmm. more exercise because that's really vague. So I split things up into four quadrants. So we have high intensity, low intensity, physical, and mental. And all dogs need all of those things, just like we do. It's going to be different, though. So my friend's little senior senior Shih Tzu, you know, his high intensity physical exercises, his zoomies around the house, and that works for him really well. (laughs) Whereas the GSPs that I work with, uh, they need to sprint a lot it's like that's a care need for them um and sort of every range in between but by piecing it apart like that we can have much more fruitful conversations about what we're doing and what works what doesn't yeah i love that and um you know i'm going to give sarah another shout out we we have her on this podcast often i think Gosh, I, I, I never really like what you're talking about. I think Sarah's really opened up all of our eyes. And then now you created this framework from that to really parse out exercise and get really curious about it. Like, I think I I used to just be like, oh, okay, what is it that you give your dog each day or per week? And then I'd be like, Ooh, I'm sensing that was a lot for them. And so I'm not going to ask them to increase it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they need to increase it. Like that is act that like it is actually a need. And so I was noticing myself getting caught between like when I was working with clients, 
noticing that what they're doing is like already what they can do and then noticing that it wasn't enough. And then it's sort of like this like mismatch of what they can offer and what the animal needs. And then the behavior concerns that would like flow because of that. Right. And so totally. I love that you, that we're now breaking up exercise into like a more, uh, just a way to measure it or talk about it more intelligently instead of saying, right. Like, okay, let's add another walk or let's add more exercise. Like that doesn't, it's not really helpful. Yes. For the client. And I was, I get a lot because the, my, my favorite thing is the dogs that are just like, they're just too much. <laughs> they're too yeah. much. And like the tollers, the retrievers, the pointers, like they, they find me. And what I get so often, which I wasn't expecting when I sort of moved into working with pet people is there are people who are exercising their dogs way more than I do, or I even like ever would, but they were doing it in such a way that was like, completely shooting themselves in the foot like like Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take my like wired Australian shepherd for a three-hour leash walk every day and I'm sitting here like on the other end of the zoom call going like where are you finding the time and then I'm still doing backflips off the back of the couch yeah (laughs) right so like okay it's not a time issue there's something else going on Mm -hmm. yeah I love that so uh, what's cool about the framework and people can't see it if you're listening right but you make these quadrants. It's kind of like a little pennant square, if you can imagine it like that, like Mm -hmm. high school biology class. Yeah. So it's like high intensity on one side, low intensity on the other. Then to your left is like mental, physical, and then you sort of pair them together into these four different quadrants. So can you talk a little bit about what those four quadrants are? Yeah. So we have, I I find it really helpful to actually think of it as like what it would be for me, right? Mm -hmm. I kind of have this I have this conversation with clients all the time. If we talk about enrichment, like what would be enrichment for us as people? Mm -hmm. So for the same kind of thing with dogs, we have, first we have high intensity physical exercise. So that would be like going for a run swimming for our dogs. It's like, you know, doing an agility run is absolutely that high intensity. They're stretching their body. They're stretching their, uh, their muscles, they're building muscle. They're, you know, using their lungs They're getting their heart rate up, all of those things. Then we have low intensity physical exercise, and that's going to be like going for a walk in the park, right? Going mm-hmm. for a stroll, um, doing some yoga and, you know, not like the hardcore hot yoga. Like I know. I was like, depending yoga, on the yoga. In your living room <laughs> um, with your little YouTube video. Um, <laughs> uh, for dogs, that's going to be like our sniffy wads. Like this is what my colleague loves the most. You know, he does his little food ball around the living room and it's like, he's like, doop, doop, doop. We call it for him. We say, we go for a tootle. We don't go for a walk. We go for a tootle because oh, so that just gets us in the mind frame of like, we ain't not going anywhere. We are going to stand and sniff every single leaf and uh-huh. he toodles along. And that's that like low intensity. He's you know relaxing, moving his body. Um, And then on the other sort of half of that, we have the mental exercise. So high intensity mental exercise, if we think of it for humans, that would be like, what is your favorite, you know, university subject that you were studying? You know, that theory that you were reading where you have to like, you know, you're reading your Derrida and you have to read it like four times to get it, but you're still interested. You're still engaged. You're not throwing the book across the room. You're not frustrated, <laughs> but you're like, okay, I like actually have to work at this. Right. Um, and then that low intensity mental exercise is like a novel. And so with those, we have things like shaping, learning new skills, um, really complex problem solving. So something that, you know, you might see like a working herding dog, like they're really problem solving. How do I get the stock to do exactly what I want? You can see them thinking that whole time. And then that low intensity is, again, that might be you know, I put a tennis ball on the top of your food toy. How do you get the tennis ball out? And I'm like, oh, if I poke it this way, right? So kind of chiller, gentler problems. Yeah. Yeah. So then could you give an example of how you've used this with your own dog biscuit? Because I, as you mentioned earlier, like biscuit is this ball of energy, like just kinetic energy, I think is the word that you used. Um, how did you use this framework to develop sort of like a recipe that might work for you and he. Yeah. And this is like, this, 
this is all born of me trying to keep up with Biscuit. <laughs> you know, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was like, I have a feeling this was because of Biscuit. Like, tell us how you failed or made mistakes yes. and then, and then how you have risen to the top at, at this point. Well, when Biscuit was little, like he was the puppy, like his, his breeder um, owns him actually. Like they're very dear friends of mine and they had his, have his litter mate as well. And his breeder took him home at like 12 weeks for like a day when I was busy working all day and brought him back and dropped him off. I was like, how do you live with this? So this is like, this is a total breeder being like, dear God. Oh my gosh. So just um, to give us the lay of the land. Right? Yeah. My <laughs> friend who breeds age. Malinois was like, I don't want him. Oh my gosh. Wow. He's wonderful. He's incredibly driven. He's incredibly intelligent. Um, and he does, he's four now. Um, the off switch arrived this year. I'm very happy for you. Yeah. Is I took pictures. I'm like, this is great. Look at him. He's hanging out. Um, so what I did is I, when I first had him, the first sort of year that I had him, I really did like the kind of walking that I just, we'd always done with our, our toolers. My family said toolers forever. And, you know, I'd walk him, I'd throw sticks for him. Like he got out a lot. I also managed a daycare at that point. So he would come to daycare, not all the time. Cause it was a lot having him next. <laughs> um, and then I started getting more and more into Sarah's work and started really like focusing on decompression walks. And I did like a solid year, like the first year of COVID of like hardcore daily decompression walks for him. And that was a massive, massive game changer. But I was still finding that there was something like there was something unpredictable to what I was seeing. Like the results that I would get were really inconsistent. And I was doing KPA at that time as well. So he was doing a lot of training. And then I had to give like, I, I graduated from KPA and I like gave him a break and I'm like, okay, we don't have to work so much. And he went insane. Mm, like, he was insane like, insane how? Like constantly bugging me. He, I've taught him to retrieve things instead of so, stealing them. Mm -hmm. So it would be like, like, I mean, right now at my desk, I like, I have a glue stick that he brought me. I have a bed sheet that I don't know where he got from. Um, I have a check it ball that I also don't know where he got from. Like, things just arrive, but it was a constant and he was more sound sensitive, more worried about people walking past the house, like more worried about dogs passing him on the trail. His recall was worse. Like all of this sort of like storm of issues. And I'm like, the only thing I could think of was they hadn't been working his brain. And so I started doing more of that. And I just dove into like, I don't know, like a fencing class or something. And he was like, Oh, I'm good now. Mm, wow oh, you were telling me you needed to do that kind of work yeah cool and during that time like you know he gets a kong every day like we were doing all the enrichment and like scatters in the yard constantly and he was just like no he's like that stuff's too easy sounds like and you could see he was going like okay i did the thing but would you please listen to me mm -hmm. <laughs> he's very direct <laughs> he stands in front of me and stares at me and so once I figured that out, then I could go, okay, now I can start to figure out like, how much of this do you need? How much of the enrichment do you, are you still getting something out of the enrichment? And he, he told me kind of, yes, I am. Um, and we kind of figured out a balance then. And then we had a kind of framework for him. And then I went, oh, okay, I can see now how much easier this is going to be to talk to other people about what's working for yes. him and what's not. Yeah. How did he tell you that the enrichment was still working for him? Because he'd do it and then he'd be like, ah, happy sigh. And he'd chill. Mm -hmm. right? And he would like chill. He, okay. He was happy to do it. And then he'd be like, oh, I can lay down now. Or like he wasn't frantic about doing it. He wasn't bored about doing it. And then he'd kind of, he has this like really low wiggle. He'd come over with his low wiggle and be like, I did it. Oh, cute. <laughs> He's really adorable, which is safe and grace. <laughs> yeah, seriously. So then did you have it all? I'm I'm curious, right? So you were doing decompression walks, which let's put a pin in that for a second, but um and we'll and we'll come back to that. But you were doing those walks. Did you ever have like when you were noticing this behavior, right? Where he was like, hello, hello, I need something to do. Did you have a moment where you were like, gosh, do I need to increase his his physical exercise? Or do I need oh, yeah. to go on a longer decompression walk? Like, did you have that um, that sort of pull? Because I feel like that's something that we we all tend to do. Like, oh, I need to tire you out, right? So well, that I was like, come back, decompression walks this. work so well. Clearly, you just need more of that. Yeah, okay. And that so did you, not so work. You did have that. Yeah. Did you wind up increasing it and then 
And then it yep. still didn't work. And he was still like, he would, then he was tired and annoying. Oh, awesome. Yeah, which was a phenomenal combination. <laughs> Okay. So, okay. So I, I, I thank you for your honesty because there, I do feel like there's just this like, Oh, I just need to, to tire you out and not like a tired dog is a good dog. Like not like that, but like, Oh, maybe your exercise or physical needs have changed. And now I need maybe to change the location or do a longer decompression walk. So I love that you leaned into that, like sneaky. Um, it's like, I don't know. It's like sneaky, right? It like comes in it's like more exercise and it's like, mm, I don't really know if it is. Right. So, um, so you tried that didn't work tired and annoying. And so then you were like, okay, the only other variable is that we were training a ton and now we're not. Yeah. And he Got was, it. he was so stoked to be back at it. That's awesome. So I said I'd put a pin in the decompression walks. I think it's important for, I mean, Sarah talks about it on her podcast and her course, Four Steps to Behavioral Wellness. And I'm curious, like, what were your decompression walks? What do they look like? Where'd you go and for how long and what they look like? So they're a little different now, just with how hectic everything is and gas prices. Um, But during like most of 2020, 2021, we were driving about 40 minutes north um, to an area where there's a number of dikes and marshland sort of trails. And I would let him out of the car. I would put a bell on him and I'd let him off. We walk for about two to four hours. Wow. And that was every day? About four or five times a week. And then we'd also do shorter ones in between. Four to five times a week. Okay. And, um, Shorter ones in between, what did that look like? Was that on was that on a long line or at a different location? Those would be like long line or like off leash, um, uh, like between 20 to 40 minutes mm-hmm. in out in the woods somewhere. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, great. I just think it's important for people to hear, yeah. hear what that what that looks like. Yeah. Cause some people are like, I, and I know get Sarah what a decompression says, walk is. <laughs> yeah. Sarah always says, like, you know, walk them until they stop running, with the exception yeah. of sporting dogs because they don't and the first time I saw Biscuit like fully like take a breath and chill out on a decompression walk was four hours into a walk where he'd spent the entire time off leash and hunting in like hunting he tries to find the perfect stick so he'd spent the entire four hours trying to find the perfect stick as we walked alongside this river it took four hours wow and how long was that after you started decompression walks? Do you remember? Like, was it a month in, two months in? That was when he hit about 18 months. So we'd already been doing it for quite some time. Okay. And I think that was more a developmental period shift mm-hmm. than the exercise. Got it. Okay, cool. Okay. So you've discussed the framework. This is super helpful. You've given some examples within each of the quadrants. How can people track this, right? Because like what's going to work for Biscuit is very different than what's going to work for my dog Peru and what's enriching for you might be different than what's enriching for me. Right. So how do you talk to clients about this? So the first thing we do is we take inventory of what's already happening. And that's always a really interesting step because sometimes, sometimes we have the dog literally not leaving the house ever. Um, And sometimes we have the dog doing three hour leash walks. And sometimes we have them doing everything perfect. And then there's something else going on. We get to play detective, right? Mm -hmm. And we look at everything that's going on and we go, okay, how do these things fit into these four quadrants? Is there a glaring emission? Often there is, not always. Often the thing that's missing with my pet dogs is they're not getting a chance to work their brain. Mm -hmm. That's usually the one. Um, Or is that high intensity physical exercise really highly arousing? Are we playing fetch with them all day, right? Are they only going to agility class and just like going balls to the wall, right? The whole time. Um, We can kind of start to look at like, okay, how are we, how is each one of these things sort of like in isolation working? Like, have we met it? Is there any problem with it? Is there, are we noticing that like every time we take the dog to the trailhead, he's doing like really stereotypic behaviors as we arrive and like, there's a worry that maybe there's something else going on medically with him. Like we start to notice these little patterns and these little things. And then we can go, okay, so let's say we we don't have a lot of opportunity for that like low impact sort of 
decompression style exercise. We don't have a lot of access to like off these trailheads. We live in a neighborhood where there's lots of dogs. So we go, okay, can we go to a cemetery? Mm-hmm. Right? What is a way that we might try this? And then we, tr- then we start trying things. So unfortunately we can't ask the dogs. So we have to try stuff and see what works. And then we see what their behavior is afterwards. Do we get exhausted or do we get like happy tired where they're just going to chill? They're going to have a snooze, right? Mm -hmm. Nice stretches and they're relaxing as opposed to like, I'm going to go in the corner and like be catatonic for three hours because that was a lot, right? Yeah. Um, I like to look at things over the course of a week um, or weeks as opposed to a day. Yes. I love that you brought that up in the webinar. Super helpful. So usually we start to, we start to notice, okay, we're starting to trend in the right direction. And then often what happens is we go, okay, we had a really bad day where like everything went wrong. And so we just went to the dog park just cause like, like we just needed to get the dog out and we went back to the thing that we're really practiced at doing, went to the dog park and wouldn't, you know, it, he spent the entire rest of the day screaming at every single noise outside the house. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Right. So then we start yeah. to notice those little patterns. Like if we skip one or if we do the thing that we were doing before that was maybe suspected of being not so much, not so helpful, um, do we backslide? Yeah. And I love that you brought up that it's really rehearsed, right? Because like there are like even though things don't work for people, they still go back to it. I mean, and and I'm guilty of it too. Like I very much was like, okay, I'm gonna. I mean, I, I thought of this with intention. I'm like, I'm going to go to this trail. It's eight minutes from my house. I used to take my old dog there all the time, my previous dog. And I'm like, there is a ton of snow, like, like several inches. She's not going to be able to find the cow poop, which is like hilarious. Cause I'm like, she's a dog with an amazing nose. Of course she's going to find the cow poop. And, but we went early enough where like not a lot of people were there. Maybe there was one person and um, she was still finding the cow poop and running after it, grabbing it. And she doesn't have a good drop it yet. So there was this power struggle that we were having on the trail. And I'm like, oh, but again, it's, I went there. I mean, I, I thought it through but not all the way. Right. I I go there because it's so easy. It's eight minutes from my house. We've been there before we've had successful times and it's not that it doesn't provide her the exercise release. It just didn't, just doesn't cultivate the behaviors I want to see on the trail. Right. So, um, so yeah. So like our clients or us as individuals, right. Because we're human beings, we're going to go back to the things that have quote unquote worked for us. Yeah. And worked for us, not, not worked for the dog. Cause it's exactly. our behavior, right? Yes. Worked for us. And then I, you know, it's almost like that's not a mistake because it is really good feedback or information for the client to be like, Ooh, yeah. You know, that suspect, yeah. like you said, that suspected, we suspected that like that was a problem. We took a break from it. We came back to it. Oh, it's still a problem. Like yeah. we're spot oh, on. That was very clearly that that was a thing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's all just information. Yeah. So, um, okay. So now when you're working with clients, you're, you're looking for like the moments where, okay, like there's not enough of this. We might increase this. We might modify this. Right. And then you're just asking them like what's available to them. Correct. Yeah. And then we get really creative. Yeah. And I love that you're co-creating with the client. You're not just going like, okay, here's what I think your dog needs. You need to go do A, B, C, and D, right? You're getting them involved in the process and you're asking them like what, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And you're, and they're, you guys are co-creating the solution Mm -hmm. instead of just telling them to do it. Right. Which is there. I'm sure there's more buy-in with that. I mean, we're like, I'm a crossover trainer. I was yeah. taught to just tell dogs to do stuff and expect that they do it. Turns mm-hmm. out it doesn't work so well. Yeah. <laughs> right. Doesn't work with people either. Right? Yeah, weirdly <laughs> enough. <laughs> we often hear um, how clients are really struggling to, like, they understand that they need to meet their dog's needs in order to see the behavior or shape the behavior that they want. And they have a really hard time balancing, how can I meet my dog's needs while also meeting my needs, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do you, if you do, talk about that with your client, right? If they're like, oh gosh, like I can barely take care of myself, let alone add another training session in. Yeah. So 
there t- like two things are sort of true at the same time one um perfect is the enemy of good mm-hmm. it's not yes. gonna happen every day that's fine um and then also when you find ways to meet their needs your life will be easier because they won't be obnoxious yes and right? then therefore so, you can meet your needs and then therefore you can meet your needs and if you can figure out a way to do both at the same time like i am i'm so mad <laughs> that like the whole like go for a walk in the woods it'll help your mental health i'm so mad that that's right because i got told that for so long and i was like <laughs> I don't just need to go for a walk in the woods. That's like, that's so reductionist. That's dismissive. And now, you know what? It does help. Right? Oh my gosh. That's it helps so much. I'm so mad about it. So, you know, if you can find the ways of doing the thing that also help you out. So, so often when I have people like, let's say we have a reactive dog and people are like, I just like, I don't have the energy to walk this dog. Yeah. I'm like, that's fair. I don't really have the energy to walk your reactive dog around your neighborhood either. Yeah, same. However, could we chuck him on a long line and go to an empty lot? Right? Mm-hmm. And oftentimes the the ways that work for the dog are so much easier for us. Yeah. So it's less about putting in more effort, except in the rare cases when people are putting no effort in. But those people usually don't sign up for training. True. <laughs> and the people, or the, instead of like more effort, it's just different effort. And usually yes. that different effort is a lot easier on us. And something like, you know, complex problem solving might be sitting on a lawn chair and throwing a meatball into a bush. Mm-hmm. That is awesome. Yeah. That works great. Right. And another thing that I tell people all the time, is to find a sport that they love, even if they have no intention of like doing, being a sport person or competing, because the sport is going to lay out what you need to train for you. And mm-hmm. it's going to give you parameters that you need, like, like a standard that you need to train to. And this is what a front looks like. This is what a retrieve to hand looks like. Now you don't have to think about it. <laughs> That's the whole section of like, what am I going to teach the dog? What do I, I like? What am I selecting for today? Like all of those things. I don't know. Go in Hannah Brannigan's book and she'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Or take a class to like yeah, take a online class. or in person or whatever. Like, because for me, I know that, um, I get a lot of clients that are like, I just need help prioritizing all of this. Like, I don't know how to do it. And I have to, I, I have to say that I started out with a spreadsheet then I moved to like notes in a notebook. Now I've got like my voice recording because there's so many things I need to teach this little puppy. Yeah. Right. And, and puppy heading into adolescence like yesterday. And so there's so many things I need to teach her that, yeah, it, it can be overwhelming to be like, what do I do today? Right. So taking yeah. a class can really provide that, that really great structure. It's really clear. Yeah. And I also think it's a good idea, especially when we have a dog who is maybe like struggling with a behavior problem as to find something that doesn't matter. Like he doesn't like your loose leash walking. Like you might care a lot about your loose leash walking yes. and your downstay. Do you care about how your dog picks up and puts their toys in the bin? It doesn't matter. Like if you yes. mess it up, who cares? It's like low There's risk, no, zero risk. Like the, yeah. no one's going to see the video. You don't have to show anybody. Just have fun. Just have fun. It's about the process of learning, not mm-hmm. about the end result of a trained behavior. Mm-hmm. Love that. Which speaking of trained behavior. So I think one of the things that, um, I keep running into is, um, trying to provide Peru the exercise, the time in nature, the off leash experience, the socialization, right? Like all of the, I'm trying, I'm trying to offer that to her in a way that works for her and meets her needs. But I think what's, what's coming up for me is that I am choosing locations that then I notice are problematic in the sense that like, we've got cow poop on the trail and listeners, I'm not really like worried about dogs eating cow poop. I I'm really more worried because she has giardia and like, she's got tummy stuff going on. I wasn't sure if that was contributing to that. And there's a lot of people that are like, just let them eat it. It's fine. And like, don't create a power struggle around it. I like, I'm, I'm not 
I'm not averse to a cow poop, right? But what I am noticing, like, so that trail has got the cow poop problem. We went to a different trail this morning and I went at like 7 a.m. So I thought I was going early enough and it was the golden Labrador doodle meetup group. Like we saw 10 goldens, seven labs, several doodles, and then like a border terrier, like in the, in the whole mix. So the trail became almost dog parky. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's wide open, which I think is a problem in our trail choosing because little Peru becomes very, she's, she's dying to meet dogs. She's so excited to meet dogs. And so she's like on this other end of the spectrum of like hyper social, which could become reactive. Like I'm very concerned that, you know, she's sitting there, she's fit, she's staring, she's getting low, she's waiting. Right. And it's, I think what I'm, what I'm noticing is the, is this struggle between, I need to meet your physical needs. I want to have you off leash. I didn't have her off leash today. I had her on a long line because then she'll take off and like her play gets too aroused with all, with all of the running. So I'm trying to manage it with, with the longer line. And I'm like, gosh, like this is just not the right location, right? It's like, she's staring at dogs. She's not paying attention to me. She's somewhat checking in. She's rehearsing all these behaviors. I don't really want her to rehearse because I could see them becoming a problem and I'm trying to meet her needs. Right. And so I, I was, I was so happy. I was going to get to speak to you after. Cause I'm like, gosh, is it just that I'm choosing the wrong types of locations? And I think my answer is yes. Like I think these wide open trails with lots of opportunity to see things at a far distance, to get fixated on, to not want to move with me, like all like the the protest digging her paws in. She's like, no, we're waiting for this dog to come to us, right? Like all of this is not something I want to cultivate. Mm-hmm. And like Sarah Streming says, right, which we're just quoting Sarah the, the, the whole podcast, is you know. um, shape or choose the environment or make the adjustments in order to shape the behavior that you want to see. And a good question she asks is like, is this the behavior you want to see, which is what you're asking after each exercise type activity, right? Is this the behavior you want to see? Like, yes, her needs are met and she's sleeping soundly in the crate right now. However, she just rehearsed a bunch of behavior that I'm like, "Mm, not loving this. So I guess my question for you is like, am I on the right track in, in, in thinking that like these locations just aren't meeting both of our needs or all of the needs that I have? Does that make sense? Yeah. The other thing that I always say to people is if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Gosh, just simplify. So if it's not working, then it's not working. And if we think of it as like a splitting problem, could she be on a long line in a schoolyard where you can see when people are coming? Like it doesn't have to be the finished end behavior of going for a hike. You can take a few weeks to get her up to that or a few months to get her up to that. Cemeteries are my favorite because people are superstitious and they don't walk there. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. Cause I had a moment as I was driving home going like Marissa, yes, this is great to have her on trails. But it's almost like we're making dogs more valuable. And Mm -hmm. she's rehearsing behaviors that I'm not thrilled about. And it's like, I need to not have her engaging with dogs in that capacity. Plus it's, you know, it's, it's a gamble, right? We're on a trail. Who, who are these dogs? But, um, you're right. It's like taking a step back and doing more training around dogs and maybe giving her off leash experiences either in sniff spots or like, like I was thinking about, um, narrow, more wood woods type trails, right. Yeah. Where, where it, it, there's like tons of trees or there's tons of visual stimulation or, or barriers so that we can keep moving so that we're not like, oh, I see a dog 300 feet away. I'm going to sit here until we hyper-focus. Yeah. yeah until the dog greets us. Right. Yeah. So yes. So gosh, so simple. Like, is it working? No, it's not working. So I need to, and then it just out. becomes a splitting problem. Mm-hmm. 
So that say, like that going, say more about that for I can see so but like the splitting the problem of of being hyper focused on a dog. Can I can you pass a dog? Right. So that dog, all of a sudden that dog is there. You know, maybe we take her off the side, we do a scatter, whatever the kind of like management thing we've figured out works for you guys. We do the management thing. And then we keep walking, we get cookies, we go back to sniffing. Mm -hmm. Can we do that? That like one minute long interaction versus the like, I can see you for five minutes and I'm going to stare at you. Yeah. Yeah. Will you right. closer? <laughs> right. You're can... right. And and she gets reinforced, right? She get like people are like, oh my dog's friendly. <laughs> like she sits and stares, right? And that's the behavior we're not loving. And the consequence of that behavior is that she gets closer to the dog, which is what she desires. And so that behavior is going to continue, right? So it works great. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that you're saying like if it works, it doesn't work. For me right now, it doesn't work. So I need to cultivate something different. Yeah. And yeah. also like the other thing is like, I think we kind of, we have a bit of a story around hiking the dogs and that we have a picture of what that looks like. And then we got to go, okay, what part of this is really valuable to the puppy? Like she's moving her body freely. She's sniffing stuff. She's, you know, on a natural surface that could be an empty lot. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a trail. We think yeah. of a trail, right? Because our little human pattern brains are like, we've tried that. I know what that thing, that that thing fits into this category and I will do that, right? Yes. And we can go, well, that could be, you know, near me, there's a highway near my house. It's got big grass areas on either side of it. A lot of people walk their dogs down there. It's not pretty. But it's far enough from the road and there's a big ditch. It's safe if they're on the long line. Mm -hmm. There's lots of spots to sniff. There's bunnies to look at and stuff. And it's a great place to walk. It just doesn't yeah. really look like it to our human brains. Yes. I love that. Thank you for that. Awesome. Well, I know that you have the webinar, right? And it's on your site. So where yes, can yes. folks find you and the webinar online? So you can find everything on focusdogs.ca. And then I'm most often on Instagram. It's at focus dogs. Perfect. We will link to all that in the show notes. Check out the, the webinar. It was amazing. I loved it. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you talking about this uh, really needed topic. Thank you so much. It's super fun. Yeah. <laughs>